Good evening, everyone. This is Lucy Gray uh, checking in from Nebraska as I'm driving out west to pick up my son from camp tonight, today. And uh, this is our 11th in the series of Tech Talks uh, as part of Rio Salado's Ed Rising program. And our topic for tonight is fostering global collaboration. This is a recorded session that will be sent to participants, but we do have one live participant who is here, and we welcome Heather, who is joining us tonight. All of the slides that you're going to be seeing are available at bit.ly, bit.ly slash techtalk11 slides. Um, and in the slide deck, obviously, hyperlinks like this are, are live, so you, if you can get into the slides, you can access all the resources I'm going to talk about tonight. We also, um, I will also, after this recording, put the recording and the slides and a bunch of other resources into our Google Classroom setup. Uh, this is open to anyone who wants to join. You can have friends, family, colleagues join if you'd like. Uh, you go to classroom.google.com. You need to log in with your personal Gmail address. It probably will not work if you're using a school um, email address. So make sure that you use a personal one and uh, then click the plus sign. It's in the upper right hand corner on that classroom.google.com page and select join class and then enter this code which will, oh wow, we have somebody else joining us too. That's great. Um, this is not meant to be a live one tonight, but we're going to be live for two people. Yay. So enter this code um, when you are ready. Uh, I'm going to make sure that we are muted here. Hey, Ruby, how are you? Thanks for coming. It was meant to be a, a, a recorded one, but we're happy to have you here. So, um, so anyway, with, with our Google Classroom, you use that code. Here it is a little bit larger, and you'll be able to access all the materials from this webinar plus everything else we've covered in the previous 10 sessions. So if you've missed something, most of the recordings are in there. I think I still need to upload a few. Um, but there's definitely a plethora of resources out there um, that will be available from now on. I'm not taking it down anytime at all. And so you can always reference this stuff as you, um, as you dive into your school year or whatever your work situation is. So we want to thank Rio Salado for putting this together through the Ed Rising program. Again, this is open to anyone who wants to attend who's an educator or is involved with education. The more the merrier. Um, we have a set of webinars coming up through the end of August, and I would love to have uh, our attendance grow, so please invite uh, your colleagues. If you want to see what the actual topics are, um, that are coming up. This is this link will take you to um, a flyer that has all the information about our webinars so far. So bit.ly slash Tech Talks with Lucy should take you to the, the flyer that um, I've created. Uh, Ruby knows who I am because she's been to just about every session. Um, but I am just for Heather for you if you haven't been to our sessions before. I'm a former classroom teacher and technology coach turned consultant. And I do some um, uh, graduate work with students from time to time. And um, I think I told you all last time that I just accepted a position as a director of educational technology at a private school near where I live in Chicago. So I'm really excited about that. And I start July 30th. So um, that's my background. And I'll tell you a little bit more about my interest in global as we go along today. Um, ISTE is the International Society for Technology and Education, and uh, there are standards for educators, and this session should address these particular uh, standards. Um, I didn't go into great detail with the individual indicators that are listed under these standards, but you should be able to do, I'll be a learner, leader, collaborator, designer um, as a result of this workshop. So today we're going to talk about fostering global collaboration, which is one of my personal passions. And I want to stop for a second and make sure that my earbuds are, I am using them because we'll have a better sound. So let me connect my earbuds here. And also it will filter out any background. And if you can't hear me uh, for any reason or can't see anything, let me know in the chat. And hopefully I'll, I'll pause at some point and, and ask you if you have any questions. 
Um, so my goals for you tonight are to inspire you to connect and collaborate with others, to show you the value of connected pro professional development, and introduce you to new opportunities for professional learning, networking, and for project-based learning with your students uh, a little bit. So um, I want you, I want all teachers to become highly connected global educators. And I was inspired by this woman, Karen Cater, who is the head of the CEO of Digital Promise, a group that works um, uh, with schools to help them become more innovative. Uh, and she used to be the director of educational technology with um, the US Department of Education. And uh, she, I'm just gonna make sure, I'm gonna check the chat for a second, make sure everything's okay. Uh, and Heather, I'm gonna mute you for a sec so we don't hear background noise, thanks. Okay, so, um, uh, so Karen was the head of the Office of Educational Technology for the U.S. Department of Education under Obama for the first part of his first administration. And I heard her speak, and I know her from, uh, she used to work for Apple, and I knew her in her capacity at Apple. But back in 2010, in the context of the National Educational Technology Plan, she talked about teachers being connected to data, to resources, and to each other. And I thought that was really important. And so. I've kind of taken that and, and tried to inspire educators to become highly connected global educators. How are you connecting to other professionals and resources that offer uh, around the world that offer a global perspective? Um, and my interest in global started in 2005. Um, I think I've always been interested in the world, but I haven't always been participating in the world. And I think that's grown over the last few years. In 2005, I became an Apple Distinguished Educator, and we attended a summer institute that Apple put on, and everybody was talking about two books, so A Whole, um, a whole New Mind by Daniel Pink, and A World of Flat by um, Thomas Friedman, and how it was talking about how the economy was shifting, and creativity was the, the new essential skill that people needed to have, and, um, and then, Apple, as a result, took um, had our summer institute in 2006 be in Europe, and we went to Berlin and Prague and wrote a global awareness curriculum uh, while we were in Europe and uh, around digital media. It was an amazing, amazing, eye-opening trip. And I realized at the time that we weren't, we weren't really visiting schools because it was a summer, and we had tools like Skype and iChat and whatever that you, we could use to connect classrooms, but maybe it wasn't happening that much. Um, and so I started exploring this this idea of global education um, at that time. And my friend Steve Harganon had started a network for teachers called Classroom 2.0 in 2000, 2007. Um, and it was the first time I saw like masses of teachers in one space connecting and collaborating and asking questions and sharing ideas. And Classroom 2.0 was in a platform called Ning, N-I-N-G, which still exists. Um, it was free at the time for educators. Pearson paid for it for teachers to be able to use it and form their own small networks. Um, and so I started one like my friend Steve did. His was around new and emerging technologies. Mine was around globally connected teaching and learning. And a few years later, Steve came to me and said, well, why don't we do something bigger? Why don't we put my community together with your community and, and really change things up? And so we created an online conference all around Globally Connected Teaching and Learning, and this year will be our ninth year doing it. And it's completely free online uh, in November, and I'll talk a little bit more about it. Um, and since then, we've added other events um, at ISTE. Uh, we had to do something called Global Collaboration Day in September, and we also have an event for leadership. And some of these things are face-to-face, -face, some of them are virtual, but that's kind of my interest in it. Um, and this is my Apple Distinguished um, uh, friends and family uh, in Germany that summer in 2006 when we traveled to Europe. And it's really important that you find your tribe, this is my tribe, and, and have a group of educators virtually or you know, wherever you are that are like-minded, that can inspire you, that will collaborate you, with you, that will connect their classrooms to yours. Uh, and that's what the Apple Distinguished Educator Program did for me. You don't have to be part of an elite program like that necessarily. There are ways to cultivate that informally, and we'll talk about that as we go along. So these are the links to the, the main things that I'm doing right now. I'm not going to go into them, but if you want to look through the, 
you know, I, I have a blog and, and I'm a main site that has all of our events. And then our main community is the Global Education Conference Network. So um, when you get these slides, you can poke around them and, and explore these, these resources. So um, I want to talk to you a little bit about the idea of global competence, which may be a new term to you. And global competence is um, the idea, how would I put it? Um, it's the idea that students um, are aware of and interact with their world, or, or actually people are aware of and interact with their, uh, interact with their world in, in, in wise ways, I guess. And uh, lots of people have addressed this in different ways. There are different frameworks that are out there. The Asia Society probably has the one that's most well-known in schools. And they talk about four pillars of global competence. Students should be able to investigate the world, recognize perspectives, communicate ideas, and take action. And the great thing about this is that this kind of these four pillars really can map to your curriculum. You can infuse these ideas into what you're already doing in the classroom. It takes some thought, it takes a little bit of work, but you can do it. I think probably the hardest piece to do is the action. Um, and there are ways that you can do that through service learning and, and project-based learning kinds of opportunities. So this is the Asia Society's definition, um, and you can click on the link there and it will take you to their page. It tells you more about it. Um, some of the people that were involved with that, that definition of global competence have also been um, part of the PISA, the OECD's PISA test on global citizenship, which was just launched this year. If you're not familiar with the PISA, this is the international test that ranks different countries. Um, 500,000 15-year-olds take this test every five or every two years. Um, and they're in math and, and reading and that sort of thing. Um, but there's a new one on global citizenship. And they have their definition of global competence. It's a little bit more detailed than the Asia Society one. Um, it goes a little bit more in depth, and there's this, and they have this assessment now. That's not, it's not a, um, a a bubbled kind of test. It's actually a set of different assessments that will will assess kids. Um, and it just came out. It's just being piloted right now, so it's brand new. But this is their definition, the OECD's definition of this. Global competence is a multidimensional capacity. Globally competent individuals can examine local, global, and intercultural issues, understand and appreciate different perspectives and worldviews, interact successfully and respectfully with others, and take responsible action towards sustainability and collective well-being. I think this is really, really important um, for kids in, in this day and age because um, if we're going to solve the problems that are facing our, our planet, such as climate change, um, we're going to have to work across borders. It's not going to be about you know, one country versus another country, um, and 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 clearly, the tone and tenor of what's been going on in the U.S. lately would lead you to believe otherwise. But I really do think that we're interdependent on this planet, and it's important that we're able to to teach kids at a, at a young age how to work with others that are different than themselves. We need to develop empathy with our student uh, in our students if we're going to be um, tackling some of the challenges that are facing us. One other thing that's become really popular with teachers that's kind of related to this is something called the Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs. The UN um, came up with these, and it's just kind of a, another phase of goals that they've set for the planet um, over the years. They used to be known as the Millennium Development Goals. And they, a couple years ago, they, they re kind of defined them into 17 specific SDGs. Um, no poverty, zero hunger, gender equality, you know, you can see them here. Um, and what's been great about this is that teachers have really glommed on to this and can think of how they can adapt their curriculum to address some of these issues, either in social studies or in science or whatever. These are kind of interdisciplinary topics that you can really dig into in your classroom. So this has been one way that teachers have try to foster global confidence in their students is by exploring some of these topics in depth through project-based learning and that sort of thing. So um, if you're interested in this, there is a group of teachers um, that has have kind of uh, really pushed this idea and they're, they're on Twitter and they use a hashtag called teach SDGs. 
So um, make sure you, you check them out on Twitter. Um, the other thing I'd like to show people too is, is that, you know, we have to think about what, what does the modern student look like? What do we want our students to look like in this day and age? And um, this is a website called Hit Record. And you may have heard of um, Joseph, uh, the go, I'm blanking on his name, Joseph Gordon Lovett, the actor. Um, and this is his like passion project. You've seen this actor in lots of movies and that sort of thing. My favorite one is 10 Things I Hate About You. Um, but he has this community where people around the world are contributing to works of art. It's music, it's uh, writing, it's photography, it's lots of different things. Um, and, and then theoretically these works could be sold and the people who worked on the projects can earn money from them. I don't know if they are or not, but this is just a really interesting community to me. It, uh, it shows you that, you know, Joseph is probably in, or Joe, I think he's known as, uh, is probably in his early 30s, and he kind of exemplifies what we want students to become. He's entrepreneurial. He uh, has a global mindset working with people across borders. He's creative. Um, he's, he's making his own destiny happen, right? And I think in this economy, particularly, you have to be adaptable. Um, to figure out what you're going to do in life. And he kind of exemplifies those skills. So when I do this talk, I'm talking about, um, um, it was easier to hear me before the ear, earbuds. Okay, I'll take the earbuds out. Heather, sorry, I just check the chat. All right, uh, my husband may walk in, so don't be surprised if you hear somebody in the background. Uh, so anyway, when I talk about, how's that? Is that better, Heather? Okay. So um, when I talk about, um, in my works with um, teachers, when I talk about, come on, slides, come back here. Slides. Okay, so when I'm talking about um, what this looks like in real life, what the, what the end product is in terms of students, um, he hit record and Joseph Gordon Levitt are, is kind of an example of that. So if we're going to nurture and grow these kinds of global collaborators, we also have to be globally connected ourselves. And that doesn't necessarily mean being a world traveler. Um, yes, it's great if everybody can travel and go places. It's, it's an amazing thing to be able to travel even within the United States. I, I, I just drove through the middle of Nebraska, which is very, it's a little different from where I live. Um, and it's beautiful. There's beautiful blue skies and green and lots of corn in Iowa too. And it's uh, you know it's appreciating your environment wherever you are, right? Um, and also you know travel for some people is just not fe feasible. There's a whole equity issue with with you know expecting people to be able to travel. So how can we use technology to show kids the world and to develop an empathy for the humankind? Um, Julie Lindsay is a friend of mine who's an Australian educator who's done a lot of work in this space. She's written a book called The Global Educator, which I highly recommend, and it's linked here. And she's defined what global educators should be able to do. They connect and share, they flatten the learning, meaning, um, and I'm not as conversant on this, that the learning is happening in a, in a collaborative way. Um, not dependent on time zones asynchronously and that sort of thing. They're practicing digital citizenship in, in real situations. Um, they're using technology and different kinds of learning environments like, um, one of, I'm trying to think of an example of a futuristic learning environment might be. Um, I don't know if anybody still uses this, but Second Life might be an example, but also just using tools like Zoom or Skype or whatever to connect with the world. Um, and global educators understand that the future of learning is not about content that's in textbooks, but it's about learners being curious, curious about the world. So look Julie up, follow her on Twitter. She's a treasure trove of information, and she really knows what she's doing with this, and she runs a bunch of global projects that you can get involved with. Um, two other exemplary um, global educators did a project that I, I think I may have talked to you guys about before, but I'm going to review it a little bit. 
Um, and it was called, and it's a couple years old. I don't know if they did it last year. Um, I know that they were thinking about redoing it or, or taking on another topic. But this is uh, If You Learned Here. Um, and if you Google it, you'll find the link. I also will give it to you as well. Uh, it's based on a book called If You, um, if you Lived Here. And so they had um, students, they had a hashtag on Twitter where they communicated, if you learned here, the teachers communicated and shared ideas. And this is Carolyn and Mary who, who organized it. And they had 75 or so uh, classrooms from around the world. They were very specific about where they wanted people participating from. And they looked really hard to find people from a diversity of environments. Um, so they had 75 classrooms collaborating in this. And every week they would have, they would use something called Flipgrid, which is now free for teachers. And it looks a lot different than these screenshots now, but um, because it's changed, Microsoft just bought it. And um, each of these classrooms were, were assigned to a, a cohort by color. Um, so there was like the red team and the yellow team, blue team. And then they'd have questions and prompts that were given to them in Flipgrid. And Flipgrid looks a lot different now. Um, but basically you would click on this plus sign that you see here in the screenshot and then the kids would have to respond to the prompt at the bottom and they could only record for a very short amount of time. So you didn't have to sit through, you know, hours of video and it was a way for people to collaborate asynchronously. You did not have to be doing this live at all. Um, so if you have not tried out Flipgrid, I think it's like the most interesting tool that and, and teachers are using in such creative ways right now and this is what it looked like you know a few years ago they also used a tool that I love called Padlet that we've talked about in some of these webinars um, and they had people the different schools introduce themselves and describe what their learning environments looked like and there was a different one of these flip grids and a different one of these Padlets for every week for maybe six weeks so Carolyn and Mary, and, and Mary set this up in a very structured way. They did a couple live events as well using Google Hangouts. Um, but for the most part, things didn't, weren't dependent on everybody being online at the same time, which presents a lot of difficulties due to time zones. At the end, they used Book Creator, which is an app uh, for iPads, Android, and now it's web-based. And each school produced two pages of what learning looked like in their schools and sent it to Carolyn and Mary, and then they put it into one big ebook, which you can download and look at for free. And um, Book Creator allows for audio, video, text, images. It's very simple to use. Um, so this was an amazing project. It was multi age, multicultural, um, it, it had a big emphasis on social studies and literacy. Um, but really touched on a lot of different subjects. And it was um, really structured and, and um, easy for people to participate in and, and not too burdensome. So these are some of the kind of design things that I picked out of this project as an example of, of how you can create a, a great project. Now, if you don't want to create a project on your own, there are other places that you can join that have projects going on, like Julie Lindsay, the woman I talked about before, she has something called the Flat Classroom Project where she does a number of things. Um, there's a group called IEARN, I-E-A-R-N, that has online projects throughout the year. Um, and there's a fee to, to participate to cover costs, but it's reasonable. Um, there are lots of different organizations that have projects going on, and, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about them in a bit. So how do you get connected? How do you find your people um, to go global? The first thing that you need to do is you need to, to get on Twitter. Um, there are two Twitter chats that you may be interested in. Um, if you search for those hashtags, Global Ed Chat or ISTE Global PLN, which stands for ISTE's Global Professional Learning Network, you will find people who, who communicate on Twitter with that hashtag. Um, during the school year, they typically have Global Ed Chat meets once a week on Thursday nights, and people share ideas, and you can just lurk if you want to. Um, ISTE probably is once a month, they do a Twitter chat on Twitter. Um, and then I have a, I've compiled a list of people that have some sort of global perspective 
on Twitter. So if you're looking for globally you know, oriented people to follow, like here's the SDGs people, you can click on here and follow them on Twitter. So that's going to be in, I can find my, my slides again. Come back slides. Where'd they go? There they are. Um, I, I switch the tabs and it bounces me out of there. So let me get back here. Um, so first, get on Twitter. That's my first um, suggestion to you. And you don't necessarily have to be super active on it, but it just will be helpful for you to learn from others and to develop your professional learning network. Um, there are other communities that you can join. I mentioned um, ours, the Global Education Conference Network, and Steve's Classroom 2.0. But these are other groups um, that, you know, Edmodo has all these different groups. If you haven't used Edmodo, I do some work for Edmodo. Um, there are groups on there of teachers who are doing global projects or different topics you can follow. Um, and my friend Anne, who I'm going to talk about in a second, she um, belongs to a group called Hello Little World Skypers, and they do all sorts of fun things together. Here's a link to Iron. Um, this is a group that I don't know as well, but I believe this is, some, it might be a Central and South American oriented community. I could be wrong on it. But this, the, they also use the Ning platform, and um, you can join here in internet, you know, in, and uh, interact with other teachers as well. Um, so those are a couple of the ones that uh, I think you might enjoy. Then there is also a lot of free PD online, like this event. Um, Edmodocon is Edmodo's um, conference that's coming up online, and they're going to be doing, it's August 7th and August 8th. Uh, August 8th is all going to be in Spanish, and very often a lot of those sessions are talking about global collaboration, and you can meet other educators in their virtual platform as well. Um, but these are some other PD places that you can meet and develop your global professional learning network. Uh, you can join existing projects. So these are a few of the ones that I particularly like. Um, projects by Jen are really easy projects that are you just jump into um, at different points in the year, um, mostly kindergarten through sixth grade. Um, International Student Tech Team Hub is if you have a, like a, a, a group of students that runs your you know, tech support in your school um, or advocacy in your school, this is a group for them. One of my favorite ones is Out of Eden Learn, which is um, it's following the footsteps of a journalist who's walking from Ethiopia to Patagonia. <laughs> and I don't know where he is right now. He might be in Pakistan or India or somewhere. Um, his name is Paul Salapek, and he practices something called slow journalism, which is uh, investigating the world around you and, and taking in the everyday and, and, and being thoughtful about it. And so the curriculum for this models a lot of the kind of writing he does and kind of the, connecting the local with the global. And, and you follow Paul around the world, basically. And it's really fascinating. He's a National Geographic fellow and an inspirational guy. Um, face to Faith, which is now called Generation Global, does work with connecting, I think, students in mostly Islamic countries to students in, in non-Islamic countries. I could be wrong on that. But uh, older, teachers of older students really like that one. I mean, there, there are lots of different projects out there, but these are just a few, and I'm going to give you more resources that you can dig in to find more. And then another way for getting, content, uh, getting connected is, is going to some conferences. ISTE, um, which is the big tech conference, um, is costly, but you can always come online to our free one in November. Um, and then IRN right now is actually, they have, an, they have an annual conference with students and teachers in a different part of the world every year. And this year it happens to be in Virginia. It's taking place this week. So if you follow them on Twitter, you'll see everything that they're doing, and it's pretty amazing. So um, make sure you take a look at that. So I want to tell you a little bit, let's see how we're doing for time. We're doing great, yay. Um, a little bit about my network and how you can leverage my network to find projects and people and that sort of thing. So our conference has nearly 27,000 people. It takes place around the clock for four days in November during International Education Week. 
Um, we, we welcome all levels of participation from presenting to attending. You don't have to be a super famous expert to present. We, we want to support everyone who wants to share their knowledge. Um, and we typically have two to 300 sessions and, and they're uh, to accommodate different time zones. They are generally around the clock. Almost, you know, not in the wee US hours, there's not a lot. Um, but everything's recorded, so if you miss something, you can always go back to it. And we get really awesome people to keynote um, because I leverage all my connections and beg and plead uh, with people to to share their work with us. And we've had some amazing people, and their 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 recordings are in our YouTube channel, um, and all the other sessions are archived on our website um, as well. We get lots of colleges of education going in and actually looking at our archives. Um, because they find the material useful. So that's been kind of an interesting, unexpected um, result of this. This is my partner, Steve Harganon. This is early on in the conference. Um, this is a screenshot from a while ago. But this shows you the schedule. Uh, when a presenter submits a proposal, I approve it as long as it meets our, our mission is, and is focused on globally connected teaching and learning. And then they self-schedule on a tool called You Can Book Me, and it goes into our Google Calendar. So this is our Google Calendar from one year. The orange are different sessions that are going on in an hour. The yellow are volunteers. And then the um, green are super volunteers who kind of supervise things from a, a period, for a period of time during the day. And we're online probably 12 to 14 hours a day doing this. But it's probably the most rewarding thing I've ever done professionally because we're giving access to people who normally would never have a chance to present or to learn from some of the experts that we get. So um, it's been really, really amazing. When you click on one of those, and, and so that Google Calendar appears on our website in a little bit differently, but what happens is you can click on your time zone and find the schedule in Google Calendar in your time zone. So you don't have to do any time conversions, you can add it to your own Google Calendar and set reminders, things like that. So this is what a calendar entry looks like. Um, it has a description and the presenters and all that. And it has a session link that takes you to the webinar room where it's taking place. We use Blackboard Collaborate because it's very bandwidth friendly. And, um, and, that's, and it's a little tricky to get in sometimes, but people seem to get the hang of it. Um, anyway, it's pretty exciting. At the beginning of every session, we use a map and uh, ask people, we give them access to the whiteboard tools in Blackboard Collaborate and ask them to point out where they are in the world. So it gives people a sense of who's in the room and, and how even though we're far apart geographically, we are similar in other ways. Um, and these are some examples of, of people that we've had present. Our first year, we had Polar Bears International, which they do amazing um, video conferencing um, from um, a tundra, they're up in the tundra, up in the tundra in, in Churchill, Manitoba, and they have a tundra buggy that goes out on the tundra to observe the polar bears. And we had these two guys that had lead, the lead um, scientist and a guy from Discovery Education were in the tundra buggy, and they did their session from the tundra buggy. It was awesome. And they turned the webcam, you can see a picture in the upper right-hand corner, so that we could see outside the tundra buggy and see the polar bears for a second. So that was pretty cool. Um, uh, another group, Vicki Davis, who you might know from Twitter, is Cool Cat Teacher. She had worked with a professor at University of Michigan, and her students did this simulation of the Arab-Israeli um, conflict and uh, worked through that, and, they, and then they presented how they work together on this project um, together. So we'd, like to, we'd love to have students participate. Um, this is my friend Anne, who lives on a sheep station in rural Australia, in, in a, what she would describe as a geographically isolated area, and she works with her students to connect them to the world in all sorts of different ways. She's an amazing teacher, particularly for people, um, for educators who are new to global collaboration, and every year she does two or three sessions for us, and she's like a miracle worker. Um, this lady uh, is trained as a scientist, but she um, she operates um, libraries and teaches moms how to read to their kids in Jordan. Really accomplished person in bringing literacy to her community. 
Um, Kim Cofino has taught in international schools, and so she talked about what it's like to be an international school teacher. She's now a consultant, but her session was really informative um, a couple years ago. Uh, these two guys, Pedro and Will, met in our in the in 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 each of our sessions. There's a chat so that the people can um, who are attending can chat on the side and ask questions and you know and you know remark on the content. And Pedro and Will, a couple of years ago, five years ago maybe, met in our it met in our conference. And Pedro's in Mexico City, and Will's in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And they are best buddies. Um, Pedro came up to Will's school a couple years ago in Milwaukee and presented at their summer conference. And I went up there and, and presented as well. So we all met in person. And then this year, ISTE was in Chicago. So uh, Will took the train down from Milwaukee. And Pedro was there with his students. And they got to see each other. It was pretty cool. So they, they do all sorts of kinds of projects together. But they also have a deep friendship that's resulted from this. Um, and then this is from David Potter, who used to work for Iron and now works for Participate. And this was like the biggest compliment anyone's ever given me about this about this um, event that we do. And it's really kind of a, 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 a grassroots kind of thing, but we want to give people you know, a real opportunity to be global, globally connected themselves so that they can bring this to their students. And um, and you know. You know, it's just two of us in a whole community putting it on. Um, but it's really kind of special, and I hope you guys will get involved. So I have some resources for you, and then I'll take some questions. One is, and hopefully this will work, um, I put up a Flipgrid a while ago, and I have not pushed this. Uh, why is this locked? It shouldn't be locked. Uh, I think the password is global share. And I'll make sure it's after this it's not locked. No, nope, that's not it. Let me, let me find it. So this is Flipgrid, what Flipgrid looks like now. And last year, I encouraged people to, um, I made a Flipgrid where people could ask questions or they could share a project they were working on. And I called it the Global share Arama. So this is what it looks like now. This is, if I, that that's, that should be the code. I wonder if I can make it so that there's no, I don't want anybody, I want people to be able to, I don't want password protected. It's required, why is it required? Oh, that might, you know, this might be a new thing for privacy. I think that might be the whole thing. So anyway, the password is global share. So if I give you, I'll put this in the chat. So um, if I share the grid, here's the link to it. And then the password should be global share. I, I typically don't put passwords in because it just makes it easier for people to get in there. Um, but I could be wrong. So if you cut and paste this, and you go, so if you go, let me go to a different browser window and show you what it looks like. Oh, well, this is it. Okay, and then global share. Let's see if the password worked. Why does it say it's incorrect? Oh, this is so annoying. Um, I think they changed something on this. So I'm going to go back in here. I'm going to. It's active. Minimum eight characters that contain two of the following. Oh, that's new. All right, so we're going to change it all together. Global share. Okay, that, that works. Okay. Update the grid. <laughs> so let's see if that works now. All right, so I'm going to do it with a capital G. Yep, there it goes. So um, this has this is um, one grid with six topics in it. And if people had questions, they could go here, or if they want to connect with other people, if they want partners. Um, 
So what people did was they went in here. So here's Julie Lindsay I talked about earlier. Or David has a project here that he talked about. There are lots of great people. This woman is amazing. She's a, um, she has a great blog called Kid World Citizen, I think. And so you can go and listen to her little blurb. Hi, guys. My name is Becky Morales, and I am in Mexico. I live in Merida. Um, I'm an English teacher right now, but also I'm a Spanish teacher when I live in the States. And I'm looking to connect with all world language teachers. It doesn't matter if you teach French or German or ESL like me or Spanish or Arabic or Mandarin or anything. Um, I'm starting a new podcast and it's called Language Latte. And we're chatting with world language teachers from around the world, trying to get best practices, tips to get your students talking, um, your favorite ed tech tools to collaborate with other classes. My goal is really to get my students communicating to help them achieve proficiency um, and just to help my own teaching become more efficient. So if you have any ideas about language teaching or if you'd like to connect and build your PLN, look for me on Facebook at Language Latte. I'm also the founder of Kid World Citizen. You might know me from Twitter because I'm always, I love Twitter, I'm always on there. Um, so you can look for me at Kid World Citizen on Twitter or Instagram or Pinterest or wherever, whatever your favorite social media is, I check all, all of them all the time. <laughs> she's so amazing. welcome. So she's amazing. So people left all these messages here, and you guys are welcome to go in there, and you can leave a message and respond to these people. So if you look at Becky's, you can see that um, these people left replies for her. And I think you have to do it through video. I, I, maybe you used to be able to do it with text, so maybe you can do both. But all these people like left a message saying, hey, I want to be part of this project. Um, so that's Flipgrid, and you guys are welcome to look through there and see if anything is useful to you. Then, um, other resources. This is, um, this is interesting. This is not necessarily related to global collaboration, but I, I love this, and I, I think it's a, an interesting project. Um, this guy uh, down here, if you look at down in the bottom here, um, Bob Greenberg retired from teaching second or third grade, and I think as part of a project for a professor, he started interviewing like high-level education experts, um, sometimes for a longer period of time, sometimes for short periods of time, and putting it up on this YouTube channel. And he has a, a playlist in YouTube that's devoted to people who are talking about global collaboration. And um, I'm in here. He came to, to, he lives outside New York. He lives in Connecticut. And I was in New York for something. Here I am. Um, and we were in, this is so funny. You'll, you'll find this hilarious. Uh, we were in, I was at a hotel called the Hudson Hotel. And I thought he could just come interview me in the lobby. Well, they saw that he had a camera. And they said, no, you can't do that here. We have to have a, a waiver or something ridiculous. So I went out in the middle of Columbus Circle. <laughs> it was like January. And he interviewed me in the middle of Columbus Circle. I just realized after watching a rerun of Sex in the City that this Hudson Hotel was in that, was in that TV show in a particular episode. So I'm wondering, in hindsight, if, if perhaps they have a thing about people filming there because they have – been used for films and, and TV shows before. And I just, I just noticed that like a month ago. So um, anyway, he, Bob has done this great thing. And so if you want to know more about global competence, Veronica Buenzmancia is at Harvard, and she's one of the architects of the, of the global competence um, framework at um, Asia Society. And you can, you can hear her interview. Um, but there are lots of people here to kind of inspire your thinking around global. So make sure you take a look at that. And then finally, I have two resources that I've developed. One is a notebook in Evernote where I bookmark stuff on global. And you can join the notebook and, and browse. Um, there's no password here. I think you might have to have an Evernote account, but there's no password. And you can go through here and see what stuff I've saved. It's also searchable, 
So if you're looking for something specific like math, you might find something if you search for math. I have no idea. You know, I have no idea. Um, but know that you can search it. Then I've also tried to take the best stuff and organize it into a spreadsheet. And I did this from time to time. So a lot of the stuff that you see in that notebook, I've tried to organize into a kind of a database um, using Google Sheets. And so you'll see tabs at the bottom of the spreadsheet. And you'll see here are links to the things that I do. These are links to organizations that do different things related to global education, specific global projects here. Um, that's just, uh, this is, looks like more projects. Maybe it's just a duplicate. I don't know what I did here. More projects, um, events, and then grants and fellowships. Um, oh, I have more articles and books and podcasts. This is, I, I went to town. I haven't worked on this in a while, but um, there's lots of stuff to look through here if you're looking for examples of, of, of projects, of schools that are, have a global emphasis, of teachers blogging. It's kind of crazy. But I really think it's important to kind of organize this stuff because um, it's overwhelming and, and hopefully this will make it a little bit more digestible. So without further ado, I want to stop and say, do you guys have any questions? For um, I know that's a lot of information, but is there anything that you would like to know about um, going global with your classroom that I can help you with? Since you're here, and I, I wasn't planning on being live, but I am live, so this is good. Ruby, are you in Mexico still? Okay. So you have connections right there. I mean, yeah, this is a ton of information. Um, let me show you a couple other, let me show you what everything looks like on Twitter, just to kind of give you an idea. Um, so this is my Twitter account. And here's somebody that pops up right away. Um, and she works for a group called World Savvy that we, that we know well. And so she's like, she, she tweeted a resource here about um, how U.S. cities are doing with the U.N. development goals. And, um, and she uses the hashtags teach SDGs, global ed, global goals. And if you were to click on this hashtag for teach SDGs, you would see other people and uh, resources that are being shared. Um, related to this. Okay, so that's when I talk about global, um, you, or when I talk about hashtags, it's, it's taking that hashtag and searching for it. Um, we use a hashtag with my conference, which is Global Ed 18. Every year we change it, and obviously next year will be Global Ed 19. And, um, and you can look through here and see what people have shared according, you know, to hashtags and that sort of thing. All right, so... Um, uh, so you want to do a, uh, a connection teacher, you want to, with, a, what do you mean ASD students? Are you talking about ADHD students? Or Asperger's? Are you talking about kids with Asperger's? Okay, well, oh, so autism. Um, yeah, so they're, I'm trying to think how, how, I'm trying to think if I know anybody specifically. Um, that is working with them. I do have a friend, uh, but she's she's on sick leave right now, or she might be going back in the fall. Her name's Sharon Eilitz. Let's see if she's on Twitter. Um, I don't see her on Twitter, but maybe I could be wrong. She I don't know if she does any projects. Um, there are a couple um, accessibility people that I that I highly recommend. Um, this guy, uh, Luis Perez, 
Um, he doesn't work. He's a professor, and he he's he has a visual impairment, but he's a general special ed advocate. So he's somebody who might um, might have some connections, or you know, he might be able to suggest some people for you to connect with. Um, there's another guy named um, Mark Hoppen, and I don't know if he's retired or not, but he used to work in South Dakota with um, kids of pretty serious special ed issues, you know, um, and he, let's see, that's not him. Huh, why can't I find him? Let me see if I can find him somewhere on Twitter. Um, that was Mark Coppins, um, special ed. And he's done like amazing things like, um, let's see, that's not him, that's him. I'm spelling his name wrong, I think that's what it is. Um, let me try again, Mark Coppin, there he is, special ed, that's probably his Pinterest page. But um, he's, an he's an excessive, uh, assistive technology um, expert, and let's see. He used to work for this group called um, the Ann Carlson Center. Let's see if I can find him on Twitter. That would probably be the easiest way to find him and to see if he knows of anything. Um, that's not him. He's got to be on Twitter somewhere. Um, the other thing is, here he is. I'll put, I'll put this in here. This is from Australia. And I don't, you know, you could probably, you might be able to find him through this. But um, when you, you know, having, so what you could also do, Ruby, is you could, um, I could, so I'm going to go to Twitter for an example, and I can, you could go, I could do it for you. Um, I can say, uh, my friend Ruby is looking to do a global project with um, her students um, who are on the autism, um, and I can spell autism, spectrum, Anyone have suggestions uh, for other classes uh, or teachers to connect with? And then I can I can type in Global Ed Chat, ISTE Global PLN, which is their hashtag, and then I'll add my own hashtag to it and just play on Global Ed. And we'll see if anybody responds, Ruby. I'll let you know. Um, and so sometimes just asking, putting it out there is one way that you can, that you can develop connections with people. So um, think about that and uh, you'll be able to, and hopefully you'll, you'll get brave and you'll try this um, the more that we talk about using social media to connect with other teachers. Um, the other thing I want to make sure you see is um, Iron. I, I, this is Iron that's hosting the conference right now. Um, come on, Iron. There, there's their, there's their twill handle. It's Iron USA, but there are different chapters around the world, and um, and so you can follow what's going. This is their, I think it's their thirtieth anniversary. They're using the hashtag IRON2018. And you can see if um, you can read more about them, but you can also go to their, you can look at their profile and go to their website and see what projects they have going on and that sort of thing as well. Okay. Heather, is this information useful to you? Uh, what, are you teaching or are you going to be teaching soon? Okay. Well, let's talk about um, your teaching soon. And, and what, what grades uh, or subject areas, Heather? 
Fifth. Okay, awesome. I like fifth grade. That's a nice age. And they're also really enthusiastic about working on these kinds of projects and that sort of thing, too. Um, let me, before we wrap up for tonight, um, let me show you what, um, what's coming up next. So we're about halfway through this series. Um, on July 25th, we're going to be talking about redesigning lessons for the digital age. And, um, and then in August, we'll talk about classroom management. We'll talk, talk about more uh, online PD opportunities. Um, uh, we'll talk about online re research, and that's research tools, but it's also, we're also going to be talking about how to search effectively and how to teach search to your students. And then our final one will be August 29th, and, um, and we're going to be talking about the importance of digital citizenship and, and finding lessons for that and that sort of thing. Uh, keep in mind that um, uh, the next sessions will be for sure live, and this this one was just technically recorded, and I was planning on recording it actually a couple days ago, um, but you uh, you guys caught me tonight here, and I'm glad you were here and we were able to actually do it uh, live with you too. So thank you for coming. Uh, if you have any questions or concerns or anything like that, feel free to reach out to me again in our Google Classroom. Here are the directions for it again. And uh, make sure you use a personal Gmail address and you use that code. And tonight or tomorrow morning, I will have the video uploaded and put there if you want to review it. Plus, I'll have the slides and some additional resources for you as well. So I think that's all I have for tonight. And I'm not going over for once, Ruby. Um, I'm actually ending on time. Have a good night, everyone, and I'll see you on uh, July 25th for our next session. Thanks for coming, Heather and Ruby. See you later.